Hello, Odalis. Good afternoon. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. We'll wait and uh, wait for a few more folks to enter into the classroom. Hello, Paulina. Hi, teacher. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine. Hope you guys had a good weekend. Hope you're ready to get back to it this Monday, May 4th, 2020. Yep. <laughs> good, good, good. Hope every all your other classes are going well for you guys. Make sure you're working very closely with your teachers, making sure you know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to do it. Um, everything. <clears throat> Hello, Wendy. Good afternoon. Welcome. Happy Monday. Hello, Ankel. Good afternoon. We'll get started here in just a few minutes, guys. If you want to activate your microphone, say hello, feel free to do so. Hello, Ben. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, Wendy. Welcome. Just a quick reminder, guys, uh, for the attendance, make sure that you're going into the virtual classroom every day, Monday through Friday, between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. Make sure that you're at least signing in to the online platform, the virtual library, Aula Virtual. Make sure that you're signing in between the or the hour that we have scheduled for class. Today, we're not going to do an activity in the virtual classroom. So again, make sure that you go in and you sign in. Some days we'll be working in the classroom. Some days we, we won't be working in the classroom. So uh, again, for attendance purposes, just a reminder to sign in. I would go ahead and Try to get into the habit of signing in right before you sign into our live classroom, just again, so you get in, into the habit of signing in and not forgetting about it, okay? By the end of the class, you may not uh, think about it. Maybe you're thinking about other things that you need to do. So again, try to get into the habit of signing into the virtual classroom at the beginning of each of our classes. And I would just try to do it before I sign in just to so not to forget, okay? Again, today we're not gonna do an activity in the virtual classroom, okay? So we're not gonna need to sign in, but again, make sure that you sign in. Hello, Caro, good afternoon. Marifer, welcome, pa Paolo. Hello. Hi, teacher. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello, Liz. It's always a good idea, guys, to just get into the habit when you guys sign in, just to say hello to everybody as you as you uh, enter into the classroom. It's always good to hear your voices and remember that um, whenever I or we're in a class and I'm, you know, covering some information or whatever, always feel free to jump in, interrupt me, stop me, and uh, the easiest way to do that is to unmute your microphone. And so that way I, I know uh, that you want to say something. Sometimes I'm not checking in the chat, so I could miss your message if you want to leave a message there. Sometimes I'm looking at the chat, sometimes I'm not. So again, feel free to stop, uh, interrupt me, stop me whenever we're talking about different things. Um, if you're not speaking, as all of you have done already, go ahead and keep your microphone muted just so that we have a good recording so we don't have a lot of background noise, which is 
you know, common since we're most of us are at home uh, and uh, conducting these classes. All right, guys, let's jump into it. Uh, today, Monday, May 4th, 2020, we're starting week 11. And uh, this week, as all weeks, we have a concept that we're focusing on. And this week, we're focusing on education. This is going to be our main concept for this week. And I wanted to try to do something different as far as the types of activities that, uh, that we're going to do. And I'd like for us this week to focus on doing an interview. Today and tomorrow, I want to discuss with you and I want to work with you to help prepare you do an interview. Now, who will you interview? I think one of the, uh, the best ways that we can, I think the best people that we can interview are those who are in our family, since all of us, most of us, I would assume, are at home and we are around you know, our immediate family in most cases. And so I think the, the best thing to do is to choose one family member that you're preferably that you're living with, that you see face to face uh, to do this interview. And I wanna start today by showing you a video uh, of a, it's actually a person who's on the radio and he's giving some basically six tips on how we can prepare for an interview. He's going to give six tips that he follows when he does an interview. Some of the things he talks about will be relevant and helpful for us. Other things may or may not be relevant uh, based on you know, interviewing people that we don't know. But I think there's a, enough in these six strategies or six tips that we can use that will help us for our purposes interviewing somebody who's close to us, somebody that is probably in our immediate family that we see that we've known uh, all of our lives, someone, someone we know very well, but we want to get information and perspective regarding education, teaching, and learning. All right, so without further ado, let's jump into it. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope that you can see my screen. And here in a few minutes, I hope, whoops, I lost the video. Uh, let me open up the video here again. So bear with me one second. Oops, hitting the wrong buttons here. Okay, bear with me for one. Okay, sorry about that, guys. So let, now let's let me make sure it's not too loud here. Okay, I'm going to play a few seconds here. Let me know if you can hear the video and how the volume is, making sure it's not too loud or soft. Okay, can you guys hear the uh, video? Yes. Okay. I don't treat it that way. So l let's put it like this. Like, this is basically a talk about not talking. Um, I work at a very eclectic community radio station, and we're really lucky. We talk to all kinds of people. Yeah, there's bands that come through. That's great. I can hang with that. But authors, read a fucking book. Uh, we've got authors coming through. We've got uh, you know, poets and drug addicts and nonprofits of every stripe and scientists. like. People with job titles like fluvial geomorphologist, right? <laughs> I don't know either. But the thing is, I have to have this conversation with them, and I want it to be good and meaningful. I really do, and I want to know what makes them tick. The problem is I... Now, he, he uses a phrase, 
He wants to know what makes them tick. The people that he interview, again, this is a radio personality. So he has a, a lot of experience giving interviews to famous people, people that are not famous, but he has a lot of experience interviewing people. And he says one of the things he wants to try to achieve when he interviews someone is to understand what makes them tick. So what do you guys think that phrase, to know how some, someone ticks, what does that mean? Have you heard that expression? And what do you think it means? Again, jump in. You can unmute your mic if you wish. What does it mean to make someone tick, to know what makes them tick? Ben, can you spell the last word? Yes, it's spelled T-I-C-K. I'm going to open up the chat, see if I can do that here. And so if you guys are looking in the chat, I'm going to type in. OK, so if you're looking in the chat, I just typed in knowing what makes someone tick. And I'll ask a question here. What makes you tick? OK, so we know some of your classmates, Odalis, Paulina. What makes them tick? You know them from from school, from hanging out, thinking about your other friends that you have close contact with, what makes them tick? What makes your family members tick? What does that mean? Any ideas? It's an idiomatic expression because it's not literal. A clock ticks, right? That's a literal meaning. And I think it loosely comes, if you want to think of it, this as a metaphor that relates to telling time, perhaps there's a slight relationship there. But what does it make to make someone, to make something tick? All right, so what motivates someone? Exactly, that's what it means. What does it mean? What makes you tick? What motivates you? What drives you to do certain things? So think about your interviewing and think about how through the interview you can find out what makes someone tick. I want you to be reflecting on a, on a certain member of your family that you could interview. And as you're thinking about different types of questions and ways to prepare for this interview, remember that the goal here is to find out what makes them tick. Now, you're going to know these, uh, your family members, obviously, already. So some of the questions that you pose, in fact, all of the questions should be about something that you don't know much about. It should be something that it's based on something that you already know about them, but you want to learn more. Okay, we'll get into that more here in a few minutes. Okay, but to know what makes someone tick is to know what motivates those, those people. I'm not an expert in fluvial geomorphology, and the truth is in this life, you get to be an expert in like one, maybe two things, max. Okay, so how do you get through this? What I want to talk to you today about is how to fake your way through a, a, an interview and hopefully have a great conversation on the other side of it, okay? Now, I did get some on-the-job training. It was very sparse. Um, and the, the woman who was training me, just sort of walking me through the building. I was going to be on the air in a week, and she's like, here's how you do this, here's how you do this. Oh, and you're going to be interviewing people. And I'm like, oh, okay. I got a pen out, right? She's like, here's how you do that. You just shut up. put the pen away. She's like, you shut up. You got that? I got that. 
Uh, and that was 15 years ago. I still got that. It's fantastic advice. And there's a couple other tricks that I want to share with you. There's, there's about six little ones and then one massive one. So let's do this. Here's how you interview almost anyone. Trick number one. All right. So he's going to lay out six. The first three points relate more to the preparation, how one prepares for an interview. So let's listen to the first uh, strategy or tip that he's going to suggest. Do some prep. Come on. Don't be. All right. So the first piece of advice he has is do some prep. That is prepare. You need to prepare for the interview. All right. And that's precisely what we're going to be doing today and tomorrow, finding ways that we can prepare for this interview. Now, uh, having said that, don't rush to interview anyone. For example, today, don't interview anyone. I feel like today and probably tomorrow, we will have some time to work together to prepare for the interview, okay? But prepare. We want to be as prepared as possible so that we're mo most likely to get the information that we seek. That guy who is like, I'm just going to wing it, man. And I'm looking at podcasters mostly for this. There's this. He uses the phrase, I don't wing it, man. Don't wing it. What that means is don't just do it on the fly or don't just do it not being prepared. To wing it means you just do it without any preparation whatsoever. So we don't want to wing it. We want to prepare. A scourge of people who think that they can sit down and hold their own, and they can't. Uh, nobody is that good. Nobody is that good, okay? And second. Now, in this interview, it's going to be misleading because you're going to think, well, I, I've known this person. This, I'm going to interview my father, for example. I've known him all my life. I know him. I don't need to prepare. And yes, you do. We will need to prepare. We want to prepare because here's the thing. I'm going to allow you to do the interview either in English or Spanish, depending on the level of English proficiency of your family member. So it's going to be up to you whether or not you want to do it in English or Spanish. But, of course, all the preparation, all the, uh, the questions that you prepare beforehand and any information that I'm going to ask you to share afterwards will need to be in English. So you decide, first of all, if the interviewee, your family member, is going to be able to, if they can do it in English, then, then do it in English. Try to do it as much as you can in English, but even if it's both in English and Spanish, kind of both, the main point here is that your uh, family member is able to provide you the information that you need. So you need to prepare. Am I going to speak in English or Spanish? And how many of the questions am I going to ask? Maybe that are they going to be in English or are, is it just the whole interview going to be in Spanish? So this is also part of the preparation. Secondly, it's a little arrogant and vain to think that you are. So show your guest. It's true. Show your guest the basic dignity of a Google search. It's not hard. Do it on your phone. I don't care when you do it. Just do it. Okay, so number two. You are going to be doing some prep. I suggest, since that author is coming in and you may not have read the whole book or like maybe even half of it, they're going to need you to know about it. So what you do is you find interviews they already All did. Right, now, the second and point, I'm going to kind of paraphrase and kind of offer a slight variation on the second tip that he's mentioning here, because I think this is going to be more relevant to our particular context for this activity. So what he's talking about is if you're going to, let's say you're going to interview an author, Right, And a lot of times the interviewer, the person who's going to conduct the interview, does not have time maybe to read the entire book. But it's very important that the person knows enough about the person he's interviewing to know what the person answered maybe in prior interviews, right? Or how much of this person has already shared information that is going to be included in the interview. Now, in our case, when you think about interviewing your family member, there's going to be information that you already know about the person, all right? Maybe 
uh, you know how the person feels about certain topics that relate to education. So what I want you to do in this, and this also relates to preparation, but think about what you already know or what maybe you've already had prior conversations with this family member, maybe revisit that those, those ideas, right? Either just through reflection, or let's say maybe that another family member was part of the conversation and you need to verify or remind yourself how the person, uh, what the person said and how the person felt about a particular issue. Let's give, let me give you an example. Let's say that before you started your first semester at the university, you had a conversation with your parents about school, about education, about your future, about maybe aspects of the major or the BA that you were about to start. And let's say that this week you've decided to interview your mother. So maybe in part of preparing for this and finding out exactly what you guys talked about before you started school, maybe you could go to your father and say, and ask your father, remember when we talked about starting the university and we were talking about whether this was the best major for me? Uh, and mom, mom said something here. She said she told me this, right? Or maybe you have to ask your dad about maybe verifying what your mother had mentioned if you're having problems remembering exactly what, what your mom said, for example. So this would be kind of related to preparing and just verifying again, based on your prior conversations, what how your mother feels about certain aspects of ed education or aspects of a prior conversation that you had. Okay, so it's very much related to preparation, but it's really just trying to determine again what you already know about how your mother in this case, in this example, how your mother feels about teaching or learning or homework or going to school, formal education versus informal education right? Any aspects that might relate to the topic of education. Okay, this is the second tip that he's, uh, that he's mentioning here. Again, he's talking more in terms of someone that you're interviewing as a perfect stranger and really trying to find out as much information already that, uh, that this person uh, has shared in the past. And somebody else can do the work for you. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying steal their questions because that's wrong, but I am saying you can use the answers that they gave earlier as your jumping off point. Okay. What he's saying here is use their answers from a prior experience and use that as a jumping off mechanism. What he means by that is building on something you've already known. The whole purpose to check again with your father to see what your mother said six months ago is to make sure that you aren't repeating yourself, that you're, you've got a point to jump off of so that any, any uh, questions that you prepare for and any questions that you end up asking are building on something that you already know about, in this case, your mother. We call this the Terry Gross move. <laughs> You guys know who Tara Gross is, okay. She's fantastic, and she said this was a stealable move. I was in the room, she said you can have it, okay. Um, so what that looks like when you take, you're basically following up on somebody else's question. So if that person is on NPR, and that person says, well, my workflow goes like this. I wake up at 7.05, then I do hot yoga, then I'm in the office by nine. You can use that answer and you can pick it apart. And you can say, 7.05? It's like, a normal person sets an alarm for 7.05, 7 o'clock, 7.30, why that? And then they will tell you, well, you know, I did the math is how long it takes me to get to the, uh, the bathroom, and then the shower takes this long, and, and then you're off to the races, okay? So 7.05, that's the Terry Gross move, follow up. All right, now. Okay, again, the key point for point number two, follow up. You're trying to follow up on something that you already know. Now he's going to introduce the third Strategy. Um, if you're going to be finding interviews with people, this is uh, my personal favorite, and I hope that you remember this and steal it, you can have it. It goes like this. Find verbal interviews. When you read in Rolling Stone or some blog, 
an interview, the odds are very high that that interview was done over email. So they're thinking their answers out. It's all calculated. It's tactical. You don't want that. You want the verbal things, where you get the social cues and the intangibles that they're going to bring to you. Like a all right, so what he's referring to are what he calls verbals. I would also throw in nonverbal communication. So basically, this means the point number three is try to pay attention to prior, in your case, prior interactions that you've had with your family member and pay close attention to the verbal and nonverbal communication that that person demonstrates or uses in his or her everyday language. So the way in which uh, nonverbal really communication takes place is, let's say the facial expressions that are common with the family member that you're going to interview, maybe eye contact, hand gestures, right? Even uh, the tone of one's voice, the intonation, the highs and the lows, the volume, their crescendos, decrescendos, increasing volume, decreasing volume. So think about really the particular ways that the person that you're going to interview uh, communicates. And again, it could be with language, of course, it could be verbal, but more importantly, it's the nonverbal ways, the cues that someone gives off. And this is going to help you both in the way you prepare for your interview and also in the moment that you conduct your interview, paying close attention to the way uh, the message that the person that you're speaking with, what kind of message are they providing you, right? And, and, and how are they delivering their message to you so that you can pick up on those clues and base further questions based on, again, the, the message that's being communicated to you. Normal human, in a normal human conversation where you know if they're nervous and you can help them. If you know that they're going to be nervous, you can see it and you can predict it. Okay. So another thing they'll telegraph to you uh, in these other interviews that you're listening to, do they speak too fast? Are they walled off? Do they have a stutter or lisp? Like you want to know all this going in. So find verbal interviews. Now the sidebar to that, this is a great thing. As an interviewer, you really, really want to hear these words. How did you even know that? That's what you want to hear. And if you can find these sort of uh, small-time interviews, these verbal interviews that they've done, right? If you're going on NBC... You know, he brings up a good question. How did they, like somebody's doing an interview, somebody might ask, how did this person who's interviewing me, how did he know that? How did he know that about me? If you can come up with a way that the family member with whom you're interviewing ask that question, how did my son or daughter know that about me, right? Maybe it was something that you don't normally talk about, but you were able to find out that information and then build questions on that, right? That's, that's a good place to be. Now, you don't necessarily have to do that, but these are some goals and suggestions, really, that if you can pull it off, if you can do it, then it makes that interview even that much better. in the morning. You were going to stay up all night practicing. But if you're going on a high school radio station in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, you were going to phone it in from the park on your way to pick up your kids. Right? You're going to forget everything you said on that interview. So those are the ones you want to find, the little tiny ones where the stakes are very low and they're very casual. Because all these tips that I'm trying to give you set a stage for a person to be casual, comfortable, and human. So find the little ones because when you bring up the thing that they forgot they told the high school DJ in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, they will tell you, how did you even know that? And then they loosen up even more because things are going good. First three tips, that's all beforehand. Second three tips are going to be all during right, the interview. So now Number one, we've concluded with three tips that primarily deal with preparing for an interview. Now the next three tips, these are tips that are going to relate to the interview itself. One, I hate to even say it. But icebreakers, they totally work. You're icebreakers. All right, icebreakers. So how can or what question could you pose from the very beginning to put at ease or uh, put at ease your, uh, your, your person, the person who you're interviewing? What kind of lighthearted question could you ask? And it could 
be related to education. Maybe it's not, or maybe it's indirectly related to education, or maybe it's just a fun off the cuff question that sets in place kind of a casual situation, a relaxed atmosphere, because at the end of the day, that is what you want to try to achieve. You want the person that you're interviewing to feel relaxed. If they feel relaxed, they're going to be more open to share with you information. And it's not even so much feeling relaxed to talk to you. It's the more relaxed that they feel and the more confident they feel about the conversation, the more likely they're to remember certain details that maybe they, they wouldn't remember had they been a little bit more nervous. Now, I understand that these are family members, right? And you, you might think, well, they're not going to be nervous about, you know, I, you know, I'm their, their daughter, their other, whatever, their sister, their brother. They're not going to be nervous around me, but they, they might. Because, you know, when someone asks you questions, right, the normal reaction is like, oh, God, I'm being questioned. I hope I know the answer or whatever. And so they need to realize that they're really, there's no wrong answer, that this is just a very casual situation. And even though you have a set of questions that you're preparing, uh, that you have prepared, you want this, again, to be more relaxed, more conversational, and so that they're more willing or more able to remember certain details that will give you better results as, uh, as an interviewer. So the first tip here, start with an icebreaker. Your summer camp counselor was right, okay? And the trick that you want to do is when you are breaking the ice with somebody you don't know, especially when they're way out of your league, is make it relevant. Camouflage it. So if you're talking to a fluvial geomorphologist, I, and I have, she was also- So he's trying, he's saying that the icebreaker, if you can, try to make it, he says camouflage it, try to make it relevant, but no, not so obvious, like you're starting with number one, the question, and you're diving right into uh, the, the topic. Try to camouflage it, try to make it in a way that maybe indirectly the person actually ends up sharing something that might relate to in this case, education, but again, it's subtle, right? It's it's a kind of around, uh, it's kind of around beating around the bush type of question where they feel more relaxed and it's more just kind of an easygoing type of question. It's awesome. It's great. <laughs> you can ask things like, what was your major uh, in college? It's relevant, but not really. It's an icebreaker. And then I go, oh, yeah, you know, I, well, I went into college as a poetry major, but then I switched to geology. What? Like, how, how do you connect that? And you ask her that, and she will connect poetry to geology, and it's beautiful, okay? So don't fear the icebreaker. It'll work for you. Last, he says, don't fear the icebreaker. Sometimes he's uh, off the cuff. Uh, questions seem to be off topic, but they can end up giving you a lot of good information. All right, point number two. Two little things before we get to the big one. Number one is uh, listen, which is harder and harder and harder. Point number two, listen. And this is one of the hardest things to do when you're conducting an inter interview. Why? Because oftentimes you ask a question and the interviewee will start giving you an answer. And you, as the interviewer, are already thinking about the next question, and you're not even paying attention to the answer that the person is giving. So one of the ways that I want us to work today and tomorrow together is as we prepare for certain questions, I want us to also practice coming up with follow-up questions. That is, we're listening to an answer that they're giving us based on a question that, that you asked, but then you're as you're listening, you're preparing for another question, a follow-up question that offers even more detail than what they've provided. And we might even do that two or three times, a follow-up question, a follow-up to a follow-up, a follow-up to a follow-up to a follow-up, asking, again, deeper and deeper questions so that we're getting the level of detail that makes for a better interview. All right, so this is what he's uh, suggesting here for tip number two is, Listen. 
Everything in this world is trying to shorten your attention span, and everything is winning at that. <laughs> everything is winning. And if you're not listening to me right now, I feel you. <laughs> um, but try to focus in, and, and don't do these corny things of like trying to think of your next question while they're still talking. Listen completely and be there, be present. Uh, don't try to get a joke in, and certainly do not step on their answer. Give them the time. He says, don't step on their answer, all right? That means don't interrupt them, don't cut them off. If they're speaking about something, give them enough space and enough time to complete their ideas so that you don't step on their response. That is, you don't interrupt and stop maybe something that they would have shared. You know, if you step on it, if you interrupt them, they may stop with their ideas or they may forget or get sidetracked. And again, you might miss out on the detail. Okay, so, so you want to listen, and you can only listen if you, last one, shut up. She was right. Point number three, and he mentioned this earlier at the beginning of the video. Point number three, shut up. Shut up means be quiet. Don't say anything. Let the other person speak. All right, so get out of their way. Let them talk. It's about their ideas, about their thoughts, their attitudes on a given topic. So we want to make sure that we're not uh, dominating the conversation. Even though you want it to be as conversational as possible, it really is about trying to get information from the person with whom you're interviewing. Now, he's going to talk about this game, and I think he calls it Dead Space Chicken. Now, remember that this is a radio personality, so his gig, his job, is being on the radio. And when you're on the radio, they have a phrase that relates to, called dead space. That is, there's nothing. So the worst thing that could happen on the radio and on TV is for there to be dead space. That is, where there's no audio, there's nothing going on, it's dead silence. That's the kiss of death when you're dealing with a radio program. You don't want dead space. So he has this phrase, dead space chicken. Now, chicken is a game we used to play when, when you're a little kid. And I think one of the, the examples that I think about first when I think about chicken, and there's different ways to play it, is think of yourself on a bicycle and you have a friend of yours who's at the end of the road and you're facing each other. So you're at opposite ends of the road, you're on your bicycles, and you're facing each other. And then you take off. And both bicycles are going straight towards each other, right? This is a game of chicken because you wanna see, chicken is a term that you refer to somebody who's scared of something, right? And you say, oh, you're chicken to go into the house, right? Or going in, go into that dark hole someplace or the cave right? You're chicken. Well, this game of chicken is where you're doing something. In this case, you're riding bicycles towards each other, and you want to see who is going to move out of the way first, because that would be the person who is the chicken. He's a, he or she is, is afraid. So you want to show you off your brave, bravery by being the one that doesn't move out of the way and forces the other person to at the last minute, move out of the way so you don't run into each other, all right? So that's the game of chicken. So dead space chicken, he's gonna talk about this, is where you're in an interview and you're talking and all of a sudden, the, the person whom you're, uh, with whom you're entering, interviewing stops speaking. So there's, no, there's, there's just dead space. And you feel like so somebody has to say something because it's just nobody saying anything. Everybody feels, both people feel uncomfortable and you feel like you have to say something, right? I don't know if you've ever been on a date, right? With uh, someone and, or even with your friend and you're in a place and nobody says anything and you feel uncomfortable. You feel like, I, I gotta say something. This, this is just too strange not saying anything, all right? When you're doing an interview, this is what he's referring to. It's like dead, dead space chicken is really forcing the other person to say something to keep the conversation going. Well, what he's suggesting is to let that 
dead space go. Let it go. Even if you feel uncomfortable, let it go. Because a lot of times the person who's giving you information, the interviewee, that a lot of times the person will come up with a lot of good information if given the time to reflect, even in silence, he or she might come up with even more detailed, more really valuable information. And the point, again, he wants to make is to let it go. Let, let that dead space go for as long as you can in hopes that the person will come up with additional information that will give you uh, good detail. Okay. It was right. It comes back to shutting up and giving them some breathing room so that they can say their piece at a tempo they're cool with. And there's a fun sidebar to the shut up thing, which is this. Um, dead air chicken. Does that make sense just right off the bat? No. Okay. So dead air chicken works like this. It can go on. And I will win. Because when you create an awkward pause that is awkward enough, the thing that they will desperately fill it with burbles up from a wild part of their psychology <laughs> that they cannot control at all. And this is where you get your unpredictable stuff. So dead air chicken, do proceed with caution, though. All right. I think I said dead space. It's dead air chicken. But you get the point, right? It's let it go um, and try not to fill in the... the, the so now these things will get you through an interview. They will get you through to the other side and you will kind of appear competent because you kind of are at this point, but it won't give you the conversation that you want to have, the one that people will email you later about and say, man, I didn't think fluvial, what is it? <laughs> I didn't know that was my thing. So they will email you this if you can set the table for your guest to be comfortable. You know when you're- He uses the phrase, set the table for your guest. Set the the table meaning make the person feel comfortable. Make sure you're prepared with how you want to ask the questions, not only just the, what questions you're going to ask, but how you're going to ask the questions, how you're going to provide an icebreaker, et cetera. You're at a party, and you are explaining your job to somebody else or your passion to somebody else. And they're just leaning in and in and in, and they're like, bring it, bring it. I want to know everything you can tell me. That is the real trick. Bored people are boring. Interested people are interesting. So what I'm trying to tell you is be interested in everything possible, right? Be interested in everything possible, all right? You might think that, well, this might be an easy exercise, thinking, well, I'm going to interview my brother, right? Because this will be easy. And I don't want you to choose someone because it's, easy. I want you to be very deliberate and purposeful in who you choose, because the topic is going to be about education. The objective here is to find out what makes this person tick. And again, you're already going to know a lot about this person, but your, object your objective here is to try to find out more. You want to be surprised. You want to find out something that maybe you didn't know about. Even though you know this person very well, your goal here is to try to find out something new. What makes this person tick? What motivates this person? And how can you bring that out through an interview? That's going to be our, our goal for this, for this week. Now, I'm going to share with you a link to this video if you want to go back later and watch it in its entirety. If you want to go back and watch the video again, it's about 10 minutes. We're not going to watch the whole thing. I think we've got the main, uh, the main uh, strategies, I think, that are going to be most relevant for us. Let's see if I can copy this real quick. And I'll include this in the chat. Okay, I don't know what that with that, uh, let me see. Let me stop sharing and go back to our room. <clears throat> and let's see.
Okay, give me one second here. Okay. So I just shared the link to the video if you want to later go and uh, watch the video. Um, I want to finish today's discussion with a, some questions for you guys because I'm curious. Um, I'm curious first about who you're thinking about interviewing. So I'd like to open it up. If you uh, want to chat, unmute your mic. I really like to hear your voices if you want to jump in. If you want to share who you're thinking about interviewing, if you want to say why you've chosen this particular family member to do your interview, uh, let us know. Feel free to unmute your mic, or if you want to post in the chat, of course, you can do that as well. So who are you thinking about? I'm going to give extra points to anyone who uploads a picture to their Zoom profile. I think one we had one member from the Propa A group this morning that had already uploaded. So feel free to upload. Again, just makes this experience a little bit nicer to be able to at least see a picture. It'd be better to even to activate your video. But let us know. What do you think? Who are you considering interviewing? Preferably a family member that you're or that you live with, that you have access to face-to-face, -to -face, that you can do the interview. Hello, everyone. I would interview my mom. Uh, she said something about uh, cooking once, like having a, a kitchen business or something. And I would like to go deeper on that thing. Okay, and Oscar, thank you uh, for sharing. Are you thinking about different aspects of education that relate to this cooking class? How are you? Is there something that about your mother that uh, that you want to find out about in terms of this concept of education? Yes, because she she uh, she mentioned something about uh, feeling this. Um, insecurity about choosing what to do when when she was younger. She she was considering uh, studying something like what she's doing now. She's a nurse, and or or studying uh, I don't know kitchen class or cooking class. Okay, and, and there's something that came up as Oscar's sharing. Thank you uh, for sharing that, Oscar. That um, when you have situations or family members that may have changed over time, maybe they were going to do something and they changed their idea. Think of obviously the conditionals, the hypothetical conditionals, especially like what kind of questions might you ask? And they might include hypothetical questions. That might be something related to, well, if you had done this, what would you have done? Or if you had studied this or uh, so think about that as well when you're preparing for the questions. Tomorrow we're going to get into that a little bit more. We'll do an activity in class that relates to actually coming up with specific questions. But that's a good uh, thing to consider as, as Oscar was mentioning that many of you might fall have similar situations where you might be asking hypothetical questions as part of your interview. Great. Thank you, Oscar, for that. Anyone else? Well, I think that I will interview my dad. Okay, and what's the, what, why? What, why do you think you wanna focus on your dad for your interview? Sorry, Monse, I'm not sure if you're 
if you lost the connection, but I didn't hear your response. Okay, we may have some problems, uh, Monse, with the connection. I'm not able to hear you. I don't know if it's just me. If you want to either maybe just try muting and unmuting your mic again to see if you can get back in, or if you want to post in the chat. Let us know what, um, okay, she signed out. Anyone else? Who are you thinking about interviewing? I think I will interview my dad, too. OK. And uh, do you have a particular reason, Wendy, why you want, would like to interview your father? Mm, I'm not sure, but I guess he dropped out um, high school. So I want to know like the reasons or what will he like to study? Okay. And when you guys are thinking about the types of questions, remember that the intention here is to really understand what makes them tick, what motivates them. This is very important. This is not to uh, drill them, you know, interrogate them in a negative sense. We want, we want you to, for this interview to come from a good place and that you really want to find out what drives your family member that you're interviewing, what really motivates th motivates them, what what do they like, what drives them, what is their ambition that they want to achieve, maybe it's something in the future, maybe it's something that they've achieved that they're proud of in the past, but it's something that you want to know more about. Okay, thank you, Wendy, for sharing. Anyone else? Liz, Caro, Paolo, feel free to jump in. Angel, Nigeli, Graulio, Marifer, Liz, Paulina. Did I miss anybody? And you can change your mind too. This is just kind of what you're thinking about at this point. Probably by tomorrow, you need to decide for sure uh, who you'd like to interview. Any else? Anybody else want to jump in and share who they're thinking about interviewing? I will probably interview one of my aunts because she study. Uh, I don't know, like at the age of twenty four or twenty five. So she studied, all right, and uh, is this someone, your aunt, is this someone that you can see in interview face-to-face, -face, uh, Paulina? Yes. Great. All right. Great. Thank you, Paulina, for sharing. Anyone else? So everything we ask must be related uh, to an educational purpose. Yes, so this week we're focusing on education. Now, education can mean a lot of different things. It can be formal education. It can be informal education. So it could be something related to like going to school. That would be formal. Or it could be informal. Maybe a family member didn't uh, go to high school, for example, but he or she learned a lot through some other means. It could be on-the-job experience. It could have been uh, even certain informal classes, maybe, or diploma, or living abroad in a particular location, right? So there are many different ways that you can talk about education, 
and I want you to explore any of those possible uh, subtopics or sub themes. But the overall theme needs to be, relate in some way education, teaching, learning, formal learning or teaching or formal education, informal. Um, yeah, so so think of it in terms of education, but you can approach it from a lot of different angles depending on the purpose, depending on what it is you want to find out about your family member. But do try to include uh, the topic of education. Of course, it can relate to, again, like, you know, uh, working. Like Oscar was mentioning about, uh, you know, learning to cook. His mother, I think, learning to cook. So it could be something about learning to cook, how she adapted and learned either through by her own. Maybe there was someone else involved, you know, all the different possible ways that one can learn about a particular job that's all open to uh, this particular interview. Okay, so yes, do try to keep it related to education, but feel free to explore a lot of different uh, perspectives or, or avenues about, about the idea of uh, education. Okay, thank you. All right. So for tomorrow, guys, we're going to uh, continue this activity. Tomorrow, we're going to work in small groups. We're going to set up breakout rooms in Zoom. I will set these up uh, tomorrow for you. And I want us to begin thinking about certain questions. I'm going to explain a little bit tomorrow about how to come up with certain questions. Um, we're not going to list all the possible questions for your interview, but I want you to prepare through what's called an interview guide, and we'll talk about that and begin preparing our interview guide tomorrow uh, in class. But for tomorrow, before uh, the class, uh, that uh, before we begin class tomorrow, I want you to decide on a person that you would like to do the interview, and I, I want you to have a good reason why you chose that particular family member for the purposes of learning about and discussing issues related to education and what makes this person tick, what mo motivates this person that drives them that relate again to the topic of education. All right, so I think we'll stop there, guys, and uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll continue this activity uh, working in Zoom tomorrow uh, in uh, class. Again, remember, if you haven't done so already, please make sure that you've signed in to the virtual classroom uh, for, for attendance purposes. All right, guys, thank you. We'll stop there, and uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.